Chapter 6 Deluge When Akira woke up, she felt vaguely off. Something about her just didn't feel right, and she couldn't put her finger on it. Opening her eyes, she noticed that she was lying in a medical bed in a very sterile-looking room. Two people were occupying comfy chairs nearby, but only one of them was awake. Rafi Bakir startled when he realized Akira was conscious, and he sprang out of his chair to take her hand. How are you? he asked. Are you okay? Still hearing voices? Whoa. Hold on, Akira mumbled. One question at a time. I'm still waking up. Well, wake up faster, grumbled another voice, before he decides to do the sleeping beauty thing and kiss you. Akira didn't recognize the second person with Rafi. It was someone she'd never met before. When Rafi stepped aside to let the stranger talk to Akira, she recoiled in horror at the sight of him, jerking her body so much that an IV line broke free of her arm, spraying fluid all over the place. What the hell? Akira gasped. The second person in the room was human-shaped, in that they had arms, legs, and a head, but this individual's face was very far from human. He was completely bald, and the skin of his face was very rough and leathery. But his most striking feature was his eyes. The man had huge, bulbous eyes with massive pink irises. When he stood up and approached Akira, she saw that his fingernails were so long and thick, they may as well have been claws. Calm down, girl, the creature said. You have nothing to fear. My name is Dayunda Zeal. I am a hybrid created by the old Advent Regime, long before you were born. This wasn't the sort of statement that would have calmed Akira. Thankfully, the sweet air did what Zeal's words couldn't. After a moment, the sudden burst of anger was gone, and Akira's voice leveled out. I know who you are, she spoke calmly. My parents fought your kind in the war. Zeal and Rafi both gave Akira a very stern look, silently scolding her. Sheepishly, she looked at the floor and said, Well, the abusers told me that anyway. You must learn to think and seriously consider your own past before saying something so offensive, Zeal reprimanded Akira. You hold prejudices based on lies. They will sabotage your own happiness as well as the happiness of the community residents around you. Understand? Yes, sir. Zeo clapped his hands together and assumed a much more friendly expression. Good. Now that's out of the way, let me explain myself. Akira Jacqueline Robinson, you are gifted. That means you have the ability to manipulate the natural psionic energy contained in the deepest recesses of your conscious mind. My job is to teach you how to use this ability and then help you put it to good use for our wonderful community. Wait, put it to use? Akira repeated. How? While the hybrid named Zeal spoke, he carefully reattached Akira's IV line. Well, you see, our perfect community is dependent on psionics to maintain the peace and prosperity you've grown so accustomed to here, Zeal explained. We have several scions and telepaths who do various jobs to keep the island running smoothly. Some people are maintaining a psionic shield that protects our island from the dangerous weather the rest of the world is experiencing. Others are augmenting the effects of the sweet air. Some people work in a similar profession as Mr. Bakir, helping seek out gifted people and rescuing them from the outside world. Also, every member of our security force is gifted using their powers to keep anyone who wishes to harm or steal from our island at a great distance. There are plenty of other lines of work for a gifted person, too. If you go downtown, you'll find the entertainment and service sectors are always looking for a skilled mind reader. If you become good at telekinesis, you may have a future in construction or demolition. Zeal paused, then leaned in close to Akira. 
However, Mr. Bakir told me that when your gift activated, you showed an aptitude for telekinesis almost immediately. I cannot stress how rare it is for someone to do that. I hope you recover from your surgery soon, as I'm very eager for you to start your training. Zeal shook Akira's hand and turned to leave. But he paused when Akira asked, Hey, wait a minute. What do they do to me anyway? How come I can't hear voices anymore? And why does my head hurt so much? It's a standard procedure for everyone who becomes gifted, Zeal replied, waving his hand casually. We have embedded several psionic implants in your brain. These implants will give much more refined control over your powers. With a little training, you'll find you can use the implants to turn your telepathy on or off at will. It's great for when you have to go visit the outside world, Rafi chimed in. If you turn off your telepathy, you can trick outsiders into thinking you're not gifted. That's how Bernard was able to get so close to you before your abusers caught on. Impressed, Akira let out a low whistle. Then an idea came into her mind. She decided to try it out on impulse, without really thinking about it. Just as Zeal left the room and stepped into the hospital hallway, Akira looked at Rafi and locked her gaze onto his eyes. She focused her mind on one thing, a question she wanted to ask. How long were you here? And to her surprise, it worked. She couldn't actually see psionic energy, but Akira felt an invisible force move from her own body into Rafi and then return. A collage of images and sounds flickered past the forefront of Akira's consciousness. Rafi's mind surrendered the answer to her question before he ever had the chance to say it aloud, and Akira was left stunned by it. Huh, she thought to herself, he really cares about me. After that, Akira wondered to herself whether Rafi knew she was starting to care about him in return. Yes, Rafi said aloud. Yes, I do. The next day, Akira was released from the Mahalona Medical Center with a clean bill of health, aside from the fact that she now had a bald spot shaved into the left side of her head, marking the spot where the cybernetic implants had been installed in her cerebral cortex. Rafi escorted her to a quiet place outside of town where her psionic training would begin. Neither of the teenagers said a word to one another the whole trek, but their minds were open to one another, and psionic energy flowed freely between them. They shared their memories and thoughts, and Akira grew comfortable with the sensation of Rafi's presence inside of her own consciousness. It wasn't long before the mental images and concepts passing between them grew more intimate in nature. After a while, Rafi led Akira out of the city entirely and along one of the many footpaths that meandered through the forests of Kawai. They eventually came into a clearing. About 100 square feet of jungle had been clear-cut, leaving behind a great patch of open ground. The place was set up like a training field. Sparring dummies set up like scarecrows were standing in a row. Many were burned and charred while others were missing limbs. The ground was trampled and beaten down. Many patches of dirt and mud were left behind by great numbers of moving people. Dayun de Zeal was already there, waiting with another person. David Sepulveda looked different from the last time Akira had seen him. The Mexican-American boy seemed to have taken to Kawai well. He was grinning from ear to ear, and it looked like he'd put on a little weight. David and Akira hugged in greeting while Zeal started the proceedings. Now that we're all here, it's time to begin. Mr. Bakir has been through my class once before and has volunteered to assist, Zeal began. Today, you will learn to understand your gift, and in doing so, master these new powers of yours. David raised his hand. Sir, are we going to learn how to make soul fire and put people under mind control? Akira was not the least bit surprised to see the image of a handsome boy flash in the depths of David's mind as soon as he said the words, mind control. Obviously, you will not. Zeal narrowed his eyes at David. Remember, you must put your abilities to use for the betterment of the community. That is how it has always been here. 
we'll be starting off with a very useful, but tragically near-forgotten aspect of psionics. Empathy. David and Akira looked at one another, confused. Rathi gave them a knowing smile. History only remembers the Scions, who were great warriors, Zeal explained. Jericho, William Carter, Tentamile, the Partogan Queen Miranda, Rystiub, and so on. Sure, all of those people could sweep aside armies with but a wave of their hands, but there is so much more to the gift than that. That is why we're going to start with empathy, the perception and understanding of another's thoughts and feelings. Akira, David, and Rafi were made to sit on the ground, facing one another. Then Zeal told everyone to close their eyes. You must listen, he said. Open your minds to the outside, as though you were opening the front door of your own home. The trio sat in the training field for so long that Akira started to wonder if she was going to get a suntan. As soon as she had this thought, an idea drifted through the forefront of her mind, suggesting that Rafi would find Akira to be attractive if she were tanned. Wait a minute! Akira felt a rush as she realized that this final thought wasn't her own. She didn't actually read Rafi's mind. She'd picked up a subconscious impulse. Even Rafi himself wasn't fully aware of it. Excited, Akira reached out mentally and picked up even more. She could sense a layer of insecurities around David, a growing bubble of joy within Zeal, who was fully aware of the fact that Akira was very quickly mastering this basic technique. Akira could sense Zeal's pride in her, Rafi's affection for her, and even a hint of respect from David. All in all, she couldn't be happier. As the days went on, Akira fell into a rhythm. Each morning, she and David would join Zeal and sometimes Rafi on the training grounds. On average, it took Akira five days to learn and master a new technique. Just as Zeal predicted, Akira seemed to have a knack for telekinesis. It wasn't long before Akira was casually moving things around through sheer willpower alone, and after two weeks, Akira felt ready to try some more advanced psionics. And she wasn't just learning new things in class. In the afternoons and evenings, Akira would hang out with David and Rafi in town, where Rafi taught them how to empathically read emotions and how to notice when someone was wearing a mind shield. While David would often strike out on his own after a while, Akira and Rafi would spend the evenings together. Sometimes they would part ways late at night and other times, the sunrise would find them both in the same house. One morning, Akira showed up to class full of energy and excitement. She had just learned to do something that she thought was very cool and couldn't wait to show off. Zeal sensed Akira's excitement when she arrived and quickly put his own lesson plan on hold. All right, young lady, the hybrid said. Why don't you demonstrate your new skill for us? Akira asked the trio to follow her to the edge of the training ground, where a gentle and shallow stream of water widened into a pool. The pond was small, no more than 20 feet across, and in the early morning, the water was calm and flat. Akira pointed to the pond and said, I was watching TV last night, and there was a movie from the old world. Some Chinese martial artists were having an epic battle. They flew through the air, leapt between trees, and walked on water, all while they were fighting. So I decided I wanted to try it for myself, and I realized I can use telekinesis to... to do... well, just watch! As she turned around, Akira could sense apprehension coming from David, while Zeal and Rafi seemed to know what she was about to attempt, and silently wished her luck. Facing the pond, Akira concentrated all of her telekinetic energies into a space roughly six feet in front of her, Akira took a deep breath and broke into a run. Akira hit the water at a brisk pace. Her foot sank about half an inch into the water before hitting something solid. She didn't pause to think about the fact that this pond was roughly two feet deep. Instead, she continued commanding the water to support her own weight. Stepping lightly, Akira sprinted across the water, never so much as getting her ankles wet. At the water's edge, she leapt into the air, 
and with a precise application of telekinesis, ran straight up the side of a large tree before coming to rest on a branch about thirty feet off the ground. David and Rafi burst into applause. Zeal smiled so much that his large alien eyes seemed to light up. Well done, Akira! Zeal congratulated her. It's been a long time since I saw somebody master telekinesis as you've done. Tell me, in all of your experimenting, did you ever discover your own unique power? Uh, well, no. By this point, Akira knew all about unique powers. Every gifted person had that one thing they could do with psionics without fear of being copied or replicated. And Zeal wasn't taking a shot in the dark here. Akira had also expected her unique power to be based in telekinesis because that's what she was good at. Rafi folded his arms and said, Well, perhaps we should consider the fact that Akira's unique power is a combat ability. Then he spoke directly to Akira. Have you ever been in a fight? No. Akira let go of her tree branch and floated gently to the ground. Then she walked across the pond again to rejoin her friends. I've never heard anyone before. Zeal put a reassuring hand on Akira's shoulder. I know what you're thinking, he said. You believe that if your unique power is indeed meant for fighting, then you won't want to learn it. I applaud your idea. This is a peaceful island, after all. But listen to me. If your special power is indeed one meant for violence and destruction, we cannot have you discover it by accident or happenstance, or some innocent may get hurt. Bakir, Sepulveda... Go back into town for now. Robinson, follow me. And then, Zeal jumped into the air, leaping from treetop to treetop in exactly the same way Akira had just seen in last night's movie. Heart thudding with excitement, Akira launched herself into the forest, following Zeal to the west. Right away, Akira realized that Zeal was moving with incredible speed, and she could also see a short distance into his mind. Zeal had an ulterior motive. He was testing Akira, right now. He wanted to know just how much she had mastered telekinesis. Well, Akira felt up to the challenge. Zeal broadened his stride, leaping and bounding across the jungle canopy at high speed. Akira used her own powers, not just to continue jumping from treetop to treetop, but to give herself a push as well. Soon, she was sailing hundreds of feet through the air with each bound. The teacher and student rounded the southern slopes of Kawaikini as Akira called out, Where are we going? Zeal replied with telepathy. Akira saw in her mind's eye an island, not too far from here. The security troops who guarded Kawai used it as a training ground. Today was Sunday, and this nearby island was deserted. Akira suddenly jolted back to reality as the ground beneath her suddenly vanished. Zeal and Akira had shot straight off the westernmost tip of Kauai and were now over the Pacific Ocean itself. In the distance, about 16 or 17 miles away, Akira could see the shores of another island. Zeal's voice filled Akira's mind. Here is the next stage of your test. Both our island and the next one have psionic protection from the elements and clean air that is not toxic like the air of the outside world. But there is a space, a corridor between these islands where neither of those protections exist. You must divide your attentions. Follow me to safety, and at the same time, guard your mind and body from the outside world. Now follow. Seal hit the choppy waters of the Pacific at a run, jogging across the sea as though the water was nothing more than a sand dune. A moment later, Akira joined him. She ran up the sides of great crashing waves, raced between valleys of torrential water, and jumped across rolling chasms of foam. Surrounded with psionic energy that made all of this possible, Akira lost herself in euphoria. This was wonderful. This was incredible. Then, she crossed some invisible boundary, and it was like stepping into a completely different world. Everything changed, and for the worse. Suddenly, the air became so hot that the sweat on Akira's face and arms 
evaporated instantly and her skin started to burn within seconds. Akira panicked, acting on the very first instinct that came into her mind. All of her telekinetic efforts stopped and she leapt from the crest of a wave, diving headfirst into the ocean below. The shock of hitting cold water nearly paralyzed Akira, and the pain of her near instantaneous sunburn reverberated throughout her body, making her convulse. After a moment, she got her bearings again and surfaced. The extreme heat above the water's surface seemed to press down on Akira, forcing her head below the waterline again. She took a deep breath and submerged. Hanging there below the surface, a new reason to panic hit Akira like a wall of water. She'd lost track of zeal. How was she supposed to find her way to the other island? Or back to Kauai, for that matter? She was lost in the Pacific, trapped beneath the surface by the oppressive heat above. The more Akira thought about her situation, the more she freaked out as she realized just how screwed she was. Relax, Akira. Zeal's voice drifted through the front of her mind. Fear and panic will get you nowhere. You have the rest of your life to solve this problem. Take a moment to think. A pulse of anger rippled through Akira. She was probably going to drown, and now she had Zeal's telepathic taunting to put up with. Rest of my life, yeah, all two minutes of it, Akira thought to herself. That was when an idea came to her. In fact, it was such a powerful train of thought that Akira opened up her mouth to gasp only to take in a mouthful of seawater. Coughing and spluttering, Akira sprang to the surface. She only kept her head above water long enough to refill her lungs before diving again, cursing herself for not thinking of this sooner. Telekinesis worked above the water, didn't it? Why shouldn't it work below? Reaching out with her mind, Akira found Zeal's consciousness. It was far away and getting farther still, but she knew where it was relative to her own. Akira started to kick her feet and propel herself in the right direction. Then she applied the smallest bit of telekinesis. About 200 yards ahead, Zeal was still above the surface, running on the waves. A psionic shield over his head was making a near constant pinging noise like raindrops falling on metal as it protected him from the sun's harmful radiation. The human-alien hybrid looked over his shoulder just long enough to see a human shape rocketing through the water like a torpedo. He laughed out loud as Akira breached the surface in a dolphinish way, taking a short breath before retreating beneath the waves again. It wasn't the solution he was expecting, but he was still very impressed. Finally, they reached their destination. Akira felt a great sense of relief as she and Zeal came under the protective umbrella of the psionically enhanced sweet air once more. The new island, meanwhile, was a different sort of place from the one Akira had just left. Kawai was rocky and mountainous, whereas this place contained many gentle sloping hills. The ground, as far as the eye could see, was pockmarked with craters and trenches. What happened here? Akira asked, looking around the blasted shoreline. It looks like there was a battle. There may as well have been, Zeal admitted. Like I said, this is where the security forces come to train. But we have the island to ourselves today. This place is called Nihau. Akira shook the seawater out of her shoes and looked around. Nihau, she repeated. Before the war, this island was the final refuge of the native Hawaiians, Zeal explained. Now that they're gone, it's a firing range. Look up there. Zeal pointed to a distant grove of trees. We want to discover your special power, he said. Therefore, we need to keep things simple and give you the chance to experiment. Akira, do you see that forest on the hill? I want you to destroy it by whatever means you can muster. Akira's jaw dropped. She was struggling to comprehend the magnitude of Zeal's request. Wait a minute. Destroy it? Correct, Zeal said. Wipe it out. Burn it. Vaporize it. Use your gift to make it cease to be. If your unique power is combat-oriented, as we think it is, then we should discover it here. 
Akira looked away from Zeal's gigantic eyes towards the distant forest. Destroy it, huh? It's just a clump of trees, right? Akira asked. Nobody's in there. No one at all, Zeal reassured her. But if it helps, try to imagine one of your abusers in there. One of the monsters we saved you from. Akira took a deep breath and refocused on the distant tree line. She had no idea how she was supposed to destroy a whole forest, but she might as well start with what she knew. First, Akira held up her dominant hand and closed her fist, all the while focusing her gaze on a very tall-looking tree. Even though she was over a mile away from her target, telekinetic energies moved at the speed of light. Akira mentally seized hold of the tallest tree and tore it out of the ground by the roots. With sheer force of will, Akira threw the tree some 50 feet, where it crashed into the hillside with tremendous violence. Akira scowled, disappointed with herself. Tearing up trees one at a time was definitely not what Zeal had in mind. She looked over her shoulder to see that her teacher was giving her an expression that was very difficult to read. Zeal's mind was also closed off, so she had no idea what he was thinking. Looking back towards her objective, Akira decided to try something else. Taking Zeal's advice, Akira tried to imagine someone from her old life underneath those distant trees. What if it was Blake? Akira tried to picture her father standing beneath that distant grove. The man who'd kept her in that hellhole of a village in Kansas. The man who'd only paid attention to her when it suited his own interests. The man who never really cared for Akira. What would she do if he was out there? She would tear him apart. Akira knew what she wanted to do, but she'd never attempted it. Zeal had never taught her how to do it, but she did understand the theory. Akira closed her eyes and pressed both of her hands to the side of her head just as she did whenever using telekinesis to move something big and heavy. Focusing all of her energies on the distant tree line, Akira could sense all of the psionic energy produced and spent by the living flora. The whole environment was laid out before her, distant yet tangible. She reached out with her right hand and grabbed a fistful of the air in front of her. Telekinetically, she seized the very fabric of the world and tore it with all of her mental strength. Before she opened her eyes, Akira knew it had worked. A loud, chaotic roar filled the air as Zeal cheered. A void rift! Impressive! The scene was very different when Akira opened her eyes. A swirling, roiling, angry vortex was tearing the forested hilltop to shreds. Her jaw dropped at the sight before her. The Void Rift is a very destructive tear in the fabric of reality. Akira had just torn a small hole in the universe itself. Trees were shredded, sending splinters and sawdust in all directions while dirt and leaves tumbled through the air. Akira put her hands to her mouth and gasped. Did I really do that? You did, Zeal said, gesturing to the destruction. After a moment, the void rift expired. As the psionic storm died down, Zeal turned to Akira and said, Again! Akira stared at him, dumbfounded. I can still see plenty of trees up there, Zeal told her. Wipe them all out at once. I know you can. Akira wrung out her hands, getting ready to try again. Now that she understood how to make a Void Rift, she decided to add her own twist to the concept. After all, they were here to experiment, weren't they? So Akira went through the same moves, preparing to open another Void Rift, but this time she would try something different. She was used to her perceptions of the distant world, and now she could feel exactly how her Void Rift had damaged the area. But she wondered, could she do more than just tearing a hole in the fabric of reality. Could she perhaps destroy the fabric itself? 
That might satisfy Zeal. Akira opened her right hand, reached forward, and then pulled backwards. In perfect concert with that movement, Akira focused all of her telekinetic powers on a single point. Destroy, not tear. Destroy, not tear. Destroy. A tiny sphere of darkness appeared in the air in front of Akira. Despite its small size, it pulled everything in the area inexorably towards itself, like a minuscule black hole. Instinctively, Akira knew that she could not keep this thing anywhere near herself, so she pushed against the dark orb with all of her willpower and sent it flying away towards the now doomed forest. As for what happened next, Akira wasn't too sure. Only a moment after she summoned the dark orb, Akira felt an overwhelming sensation of fatigue and exhaustion wash over her body. Suddenly, and without warning, Akira was completely and totally spent. Akira tried to remain standing to keep her eyes open, but she no longer had the strength to do either. She fell backwards, only vaguely aware of hitting the ground. All around her, Akira could hear a terrible crashing sound, accompanied by racing wind, rushing water, and Zeal's excited yelling. Slipping into and out of consciousness, Akira tried to speak, to scream, but the effort alone caused her to pass out.